We're just going to still our hearts again in God's presence and just ask for his blessing upon the meeting tonight. Our Father in heaven, we're coming before thee again. In and through the precious name of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank thee tonight for the one who loved us and gave himself so freely for us. We thank thee, Father, tonight for that sense of sins forgiven in our lives, those of us who are washed in the blood. Father, we thank thee tonight for Christ and all of his beauty and all of his glory. And we pray tonight, Father, that the living Lord Jesus would be made real in this meeting. We pray tonight, Father, that you would reveal Christ in all his beauty to some unneedy soul tonight in this meeting. Father, to that end, we want to take authority over every principality and power. We want to ask, Father, that you would take control of every thought. You would take control of every inclination of the heart and of the mind. And Father, as your word reminds us, you want to bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Father, we know tonight that every demon in hell is subject to thee. We know tonight, Father, that everything in this universe is subject to thee. And we ask tonight, Father, that you would come and take control. And that, Father, through the darkness of sin and the wickedness of man, that you would uplift Christ. And that he would be seen in all his beauty. And, Father, to these things we lay them at your feet. In the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Now, if you'll turn with me tonight, please, to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19 for our first reading. And then we're going to shoot over to Hebrews chapter 2, just for one simple verse. Genesis chapter 19, and beginning to read at verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you'll read along with someone beside you. And you'll follow with me in your mind and in the page as we go down through this wonderful chapter in God's Word. Genesis chapter 19, and beginning to read at verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay. But we will abide in the street all night. And then go down to verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. 
But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Then keep your hand there in Genesis 19 and go over to Hebrews chapter 2. We nearly don't need to turn to it, but it's good to get the Word of God before us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. It's a well-known verse. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Amen. And God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts. Now you'll turn back to Genesis chapter 19 and you'll follow with us down through this marvelous chapter. We could have turned to another passage of Scripture in God's Word tonight. We could have turned over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. And in fact, it was 1,800 years later, after the Holy Spirit so meticulously accorded for us this event, this thing that happened in Genesis, chapter 19, that the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 17 starts to preach from this marvelous passage in the Word of God. And as you read down through the chapter, the Lord, He heals the ten lepers there at the beginning and in the middle. And then the Pharisees come to the Lord out of the crowd and they come with their objections to Christ and they're seeking for a sign. And the Lord says about all the signs and a few signs that are following in the chapter, chapter 17. And so the Lord relates the signs of Noah's day and then the signs of Lot's day to his second coming, to his second coming. And as I think about the signs of Noah's day, I think I could paint a title over Noah's day and I could say one of the characterizing factors of Noah's day was this that it was characterized by the corruption of the seed of man. You see, if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we would find in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God gives a marvelous promise of the coming Messiah. The coming Messiah. And the Lord says there will be one that will come, and his heel shall be bruised, but he shall crush the serpent's head the serpent's head. And you know, the old devil wasn't too far away that day. And the devil knew there was going to come one who would be the seed of the woman, who would crush his head. And so from that moment forth, the devil sought to corrupt the seed of man. And when we come down into Genesis chapter 6, we find that the sons of God, who all the way throughout Scripture are the angels, they came down onto the sons of men, the daughters of men. They saw that they were fair, and they took all of wives of which they chose. And so the devil was corrupting the seed of man, the seed of man. And we know how it ended. It ended with God having to send a great flood upon the world and destroying every man, woman, and child that ever lived. It was only yet saved. And you see, friends, I believe we've passed by the days of Noah. You see, the days of Noah was not only the corruption of the seed of man, but it was the hardness of men's hearts. You remember how Noah, he preached for 120 years, and only eight were saved. The hearts of men were so hard that God said to Noah, I'll give you 120 years to preach. Do you think Noah was a bad preacher? I think Noah was a preacher of righteousness. That's what Peter says. And here's Noah for 120 years standing before men and women, uplifting God and uplifting his word and uplifting his righteousness, and only eight were saved. We would fire him off every mission board we had. And you see, the days of Noah, the hardness of man's hearts, But you see, I believe we've passed the days of Noah and then the Lord Jesus goes into the days of Lot. The days of Lot. 
And if Noah's day was characterized by the corruption of the seed of man, well, Lot's day was characterized of the corruption of man sinning sexually with man. That's what his day was characterized by. You see, friends, we're in the days of Lot today. And that's why in that chapter of Luke 17, if you read down through it very carefully, the Lord Jesus goes to great pains to show us that they married and were given in marriage in the days of Noah. But when you read about the days of Lot, you don't read about marriage. You see, the Lord did not recognize that as marriage. He couldn't. He couldn't recognize it as marriage. And friends, I don't need to tell you today that the thing that is characterizing this world today is the complete mockery of God's marriage. God's marriage. It's not so much the sin of sodomy or the sin of lesbianism, but it's the fact that men are mocking God's institution of marriage. That's what we see today. The three things that have crippled this world today and have destroyed God's marriage, sodomy, lesbianism, and sadly, divorce. Those are the three things. And those are the three things today that characterize the generation in which we live in. These, my friends, are the days of Lot. And the Lord says, when you see these things happening, It'll not be long till I return. But you always remember in your mind that that's the second coming of Christ to the earth. And the Holy Spirit was pleased to reveal to the Apostle Paul the beautiful rapture and translation of the church. How close must we be to the coming of the Lord? Our brother was singing about it tonight. You see, the same day that Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah, it rained down fire and brimstone. Rain down fire and brimstone. That was the last thing in the days of Lot. And the last thing that will happen in these days before Christ returns. He's not going to destroy the world with a flood again. But he's going to burn it with fire. Just turn over very quickly to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I think we should read these words of Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Look what Peter says in verse 3. Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Scoffers just simply means mockers. Men mocking God. In the last days there shall be mockers, listen to it, walking after their own lusts. It's not what Romans says? Burned in their hearts, burned with lust in their hearts one against another. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You know, there's men today in the world and that's what they're saying. Where is the promise of his coming? Preacher, I've heard this for, for 10 years, 20 years. Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back. There's maybe unsaved in the soul in the meeting tonight, and you're saying, where's the promise of his coming? Verse 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, that's creation whereby the world at the end was being overflowed with water, perished. That's the flood. But the heavens and earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You see, there's coming a day when this world shall be burned with fire. Burned with fire. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Notice all the things in that verse that are going to be destroyed. The heavens, 
the first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven. Because remember, Satan fell from the third heaven. It's been polluted. The elements, all the material matter that God spoke into existence, everything that holds the world together one day will burn with fire. And the earth also. The earth also. And so these characterizing factors of Lot's day are going to be played out in their totality when Christ comes back to the earth. And when he set up his glorious millennial kingdom, then the earth shall be burned with fire. And God will deal with ungodly men and women to perdition. And then as we come down, Luke chapter 17, still in our minds, the Lord Jesus summarizes the whole chapter with three simple words. Remember Lot's wife. You find that verse in Luke 17 and you look at the previous verse and it talks about turning away, turning back. And I'm imagining in my mind as the Lord Jesus Christ stands before the great crowds of men and women and as soon as he mentions the word turning back and looking back, Lot's wife comes into his mind. And those three powerful words that have echoed down through the countless ages of eternity, and have been the theme of many gospel messages, and have been the death blow of many sinners that have gone out into hell without Christ. Remember, Lot's wife. Lot's wife. You see, I wish tonight by the power and the help of the Holy Spirit to take us just for a little moment and a little while for a guided tour through all the privileges that Lot's wife faced, all the privileges that Lot's wife experienced. And there was many of them, many of them. But she neglected. She neglected so great salvation. You see, the first thing I remember about Lot's wife is this. It's in Genesis chapter 18, and it's in verse 23. The first thing I remember about Lot's wife is this, is that she received patient intercession. Patient intercession. It says in verse 23 that Abraham drew near. Abraham drew near to God. And Abraham's cry is this, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And here's a great man of intercession, and he's coming before his God. And he knows there's a nephew down in Sodom, and he's in sin. And the scriptures don't tell us whether Lot took his wife into Sodom or not, or whether he got his wife in Sodom. We don't know, and we can't be dogmatic. But Abraham was interceding for that family. Lot knew he had an old uncle out there in the hill before God, and and he was weeping, and he was crying over him, and he was praying for him to get right with God. And I'm sure Abraham had a little prayer list up on his wall, and there was Lot's name, and there was his wife, and there was his two daughters, and there was him interceding for the, for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, weeping before God and crying for God to spare the city. He goes down through at 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. There was not even 10 righteous in the plains and in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see one of the privileges this woman had? She received patient intercession. He was patient. I would have given up about 40. But do you see the mercy of God? God's mercy will save men and women that I would let go to hell. God's mercy is so rich and so beautiful and so wonderful that he'll go right to the very end with the sinner. He'll go to the very last step. He'll plead with the soul for as long as he can. The long-suffering of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. The mercy of God. 
And we heard tonight when Bertie preached, or the other night when Bertie preached about that uncle that he had who, who interceded for him and was on his knees for him. There's someone in the meeting tonight and you've received patient intercession. There's someone in the meeting tonight and you've got a loved one and man, they're holding on for you. And they're praying that God will shake you and God will waken you up to your need of Christ. And they're not letting go. And God is on your heels tonight and he's hounding you down. And he's being patient with you. What a blessing she received. What a privilege was bestowed upon this woman to receive patient intercession from a man outside the city who knew God. He's holding on for her soul. You see, she not only received patient intercession, but in Genesis 19 and verse 1, she experienced a precious visitation. You see, the two angels came into Sodom. They were sent by God himself. Two divine servants of God coming down into this wicked city to tell a man that he needed to escape. And I don't need to tell you tonight that God has sent two angels. God has sent his servants. God has sent his voice and his word to you to get right with him. You see, I would have a message delivered by two angels and the queen herself. What a blessing. And she brought them into her home. And I'm sure she prepared them food and Lot said, bathe your feet and all the rest of it and put them up for the night. But yet, she perished. You see, you read in Genesis 18, verse 2, that these angels appeared unto Abraham as men. But they appeared unto Lot as angels. As angels. What a blessing. They didn't come into his home and unveil their character. They didn't come into his home and pretend they were some other types of servants. No, they were very forthright. They were angels. The three men coming and revealing themselves as men to Abraham, we know one of them was the Lord Jesus. It's called a Christophany. Because then Abraham interceded before the Lord. But they came into Lot's home as angels. And I read in Hebrews, verse, Hebrews 13, verse 2, with regards to Abraham, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Abraham, oh, they came into Abraham's home as men. But they went and they visited Lot's family as angels, giving him a divine message from God. Couldn't have got any clearer. Dear unsaved soul in the meeting tonight, you're experiencing a precious, precious visitation from the Lord. This morning I was driving to work. I was heading over to Rathor Island and I was passing the mission. Dear brethren are having a mission there in, in Lurgan. And I was going out to Waringsford Road, Waringstown Road. And I said to myself, Lord, you've come and you've visited Lurgan another time. There's a light in the beacon in the center of Lurgan. And I wonder how many men and women that have been unsaved have gathered into that mission just like this one here. And God has come down and he's visited that town. And I wonder how many have drove past and just ignored God's precious visitation. And as I drove back down the road last night or tonight, praying away, saying, Lord, bless them men, give them souls. I turned round to the right and the tent was gone. You see, the missions have to come to a close. God's voice is going to come silent. And that mission closed and I wonder tonight, friends, in Lurgan Hospital and in Craigavon Hospital, how many men and women who maybe drove past that mission and sneered at God and mocked at God and tonight they're going out into eternity. They experienced a precious visitation from God and they rejected it. They turned away from it. 
They cried like those men in the crowd, we will not have this man to rule over us. And now they realize it's all too true in a lost eternity. And dear unsaved soul, this tent here won't be here forever as well. And God is visiting you tonight. It's a precious visitation of God. You know, Christ came over 2,000 years ago. That was a precious visitation of God manifest in flesh. Coming down onto this world and going to a cross to die for the sins of the world. It's a precious visitation. But tonight he's coming and he's speaking to you. See, not only did she receive patient intercession, and not only did she receive a divine or experience a divine, this wonderful, precious visitation, but she was warned of a pending destruction. See verse 13. The angels say unto Lot and the family, Get out, for we will destroy this place. And I don't need to tell you tonight, dear unsaved soul, what will happen if you reject God's offer of mercy. If you reject the Savior's call for the last time, as he tells you of the serious and dangerous fate of dying without him. I think of Luke chapter 16 there of the rich man in hell, and as he lifts up his eyes, he cries in hell. Oh, Lazarus, just bring your finger and dip it in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You see, his body was in the grave. His brain was in the grave. His eyes were in the grave. Every faculty of his body was in the grave, but his mind was ever, was ever real. His conscience, he could see it all and hear it all and know it all. And old Abraham just cries back to him and says, Son, remember. Remember. And someday you'll wake up in a lost eternity and it'll be too late and you'll hear the cry from God the Father. Son, remember. Remember all the gospel messages you heard. Remember all the meetings you sat in when Christ was uplifted and exalted and you rejected him. Remember all the people that came to you and were concerned about your soul and loved you and wanted to see you saved and you rejected him. You'll remember. Oh, the memory. The memory in hell. She was warned of a pending destruction. The destruction was coming. But here's a good bit. In verse 16 we see she was given a personal invitation. The angels laid hold of her hand and let her out. That's personal. An angel got the hand of Lot and took him out. An angel came over to Lot's wife and grabbed her by the hand and took her out. A personal invitation to leave the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and to get out and to be saved. You see, they not only let her out, but if you read down through the passage, they pointed her to the place of salvation. They not only took her by the hand and let her out of Sodom and Gomorrah, but they turned around and they pointed to a place of safety, the mountain. The mountain. And dear unsaved soul, tonight I want you to let the Lord Jesus Christ lead you out. Lead you out tonight and point you to the place of Calvary. You're standing tonight, dear unsaved soul, and you're gazing upon the cross. Christ has come to you tonight and he has given you a personal invitation to take him as your saviour. And he's led you out tonight by the Holy Spirit. He's got a hold of you. You're maybe lingering in the seat tonight and you don't know what could be for your life. And while you sit and linger in your seat tonight, the Holy Ghost reaches down into your heart and he gets a hold of you and he shakes you and he's led you out and he's placed you before Calvary and you see the place of salvation, but you're going to neglect it. You're going to neglect it. I want you to gaze upon the cross tonight. I want you to gaze upon Calvary tonight. 
And I want you to picture the Lord Jesus dying there in your guilty room instead, with his arms outstretched, his hands pierced, the crown of thorns upon his head, and that was only the physical sufferings of Christ. But I want you to hear him crying out from the depths of his soul, How shall we escape? How shall you escape if you neglect so great salvation? I can see the Lord Jesus pointing to himself, I am salvation, friend, salvation tonight is Christ. Christ. Salvation isn't going to a church. Salvation isn't being covered by a doctrine. Salvation isn't doing a million things. Salvation is wrapped up completely, 100%, in its totality in Christ. Salvation is Christ. Verse 17, escape for thy life. Look not behind me, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. Escape to the mountain. And there's some tonight and you're looking at salvation. Oh, can you see Lot's wife standing there in the plain? Sodom's behind her and the mountains before her. Sodom's behind her and the city of Zoar's before her. And she's standing with her very own eyes and she's, she's gazing upon the place of salvation that will save her. She's gazing upon the place that will give her refuge from the wrath of God. She sees it with her own eyes. And tonight, unsaved soul, like on many occasions, you have gazed at Christ on Calvary. You've seen him on the mountain. You've seen him dying between two thieves. You've seen him uplifted. You've seen him exalted. You've seen him died. You've seen him rose again. And you're still not saved. I can't, I can't understand it. I can't understand it. The Father tonight cries these words. This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. An unsaved soul, it doesn't matter in the meeting tonight if I preach till I'm blue in the face. If you don't hear the voice of Christ. If you don't hear the voice of Christ tonight. You see, the text below us says, A master has come and he calleth for thee. Can you hear his call? Can you hear his call? Can you hear him calling you? You see, John 10 and 9 says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. There was a place of salvation. There was a door. There was a window of opportunity. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Salvation's there. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, the Savior died. The Savior was buried. But praise God, he rose again. He rose again. And you know, he's calling you tonight personally. Every one of us in the meeting tonight have been given a personal call by the Savior. It's your turn tonight. You see, not only did she receive patient intercession, not only did she experience a precious visitation, and not only was she warned of a pending destruction, and not only was she given a personal invitation, but finally I remember about Lot's wife. She ignored the proper instruction. The angels came down and they said to her, Don't look back. Don't look back. And verse 26 says, But, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt of salt. She was so close. She had been given that invitation out and she had seen the place of salvation and the place of safety. But she looked back. She loved Sodom. She loved her sin. She loved her lifestyle. And she wouldn't let it go. 
She wanted the sins and the pleasures of the world more than she wanted to be saved. She wanted all the things that the world could give now in time, but she didn't give a thought for her soul in eternity. There was a man who went to our church, David Baxter. He's a missionary with his wife, Chris, out in New Mexico. And I think if my mind serves me right, it was him who told the story. He was telling us the story of how the natives caught monkeys with nuts in a jar. And what happened is, is a native would go out with a glass jar, about so big, and a wee bit of string would be attached to the glass jar, and it would be tied to something that couldn't move, and he would just get the nut, and he would place it down into the jar. And then they would go off about their business, hoping that a wee monkey would come along, and he would see the nut, and he would try to get it. And a wee monkey would come along and, and he would see the nut in the jar and, and he would come over to the jar and he would place his hand down inside through the jar. See the hands open reaching in. And he would grab the nut. His fist is clenched now. He's got it. And then the wee monkey would turn to walk away and, and his arm would be caught. His arm was caught because he was holding on to the nut, but all he had to do was let go and he could get his hand out. But he wanted the nut. And he wouldn't let go. And then the man would come along and find the little monkey. He could be there for days and he still wants this wee nut and he won't let go. He's willing to die for it. The old hunter would reach down and grab the little monkey by the wrist and he would squeeze it as tightly as he could. And the wee monkey would let go. It's over. But you see, tonight there's someone in the meeting and, and forgive me about saying it, you're like a monkey. You're holding on to your sin. You're holding on to your pleasures of the world. You're holding on to your lifestyle and your money and your wealth and your health and all the rest of it. And you'll not let go. You'll not let go. And someday you'll realize all you had to do was let go. Take up your cross and follow Christ. You'll find in the Scriptures that it was only the one sin that took the man to hell. Oh, there was Judas. It was just the love of money. One sin. There was that young man our brother preached on the other night, the rich young ruler. It was money again. It was covetousness. One sin. The Romans came to the John the Baptist, and, and John the Baptist said, Oh, the requirements are, oh, you exact no more than what you're given, and do no injury to any man. It's just the one sin. It's going to be the one sin. Just the one thing that's going to take you down. Friend, the Lord Jesus is the only way tonight. He is the way, the truth, and praise God, He's the life. And praise God, tonight I can say I have been a subject of God's mercy. Our brother sung about it tonight. I'll maybe get him to come up and sing that closing piece before he goes. You see, it says there in that same verse, the Lord being merciful unto him. Mercy. Merciful. And you need to make the step now, sinner, the step of repentance. And come to the Lord Jesus Christ and move towards Him and, and throw yourself upon Him and just give it up now. And say, Lord, if Thou canst make me whole, cleanse this old undeserving sinner. Make me new, Lord. Fill me with Your Spirit, Lord. Make it real. Make it real. Oh, what privilege has Lot's wife received? What privileges. But she turned back. She turned back. And I pray tonight that there be no unsaved soul in the meeting and you would turn back. But you would turn away from the sins of the world and all those things that are taking you down that you knew were wrong and you'd turn to Christ. And you would see Him. How shall you escape? 
if you neglect so great salvation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we we come before thee again, Lord. Father, we come before thee so needy, Lord, so helpless. Father, without anything that would commend ourselves to thee at all. But we praise thee tonight, O God, we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Father, thou dost look upon us as thine only beloved Son. Because the Lord took our place and died in our guilty room instead, ah, oh, we've been changed from those filthy garments to royal robes of righteousness. Adopted into thy family, Lord. Father, we ask tonight that you would do a work, O God, tonight. A work that only can be done by thee, Father, saving souls. Father, we want to give all the glory to thee, all the glory to thy holy name. Thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray it all in his precious name. Amen.